uh, uh, before we start, is the aircon very cold? Or is it just nice? Just nice. Okay. 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 Um, so welcome once again to the Buddhist Mahavira's Dhammadana series. Uh, this is the fifth of the dialogue sessions that we have um, organized since the, if I'm not mistaken, October of last year. And all this is thanks due to Bhante Dr. Chandima's initiative. Uh, we've conducted five. This today will be the fifth uh, of the dialogue series. And each time we will invite, uh, hopefully there's somebody who uh, is uh, very knowledgeable about Buddhism and will discuss a contemporary subject. Uh, today is a little bit more, um, I will say, indoctrinal, more spiritual, <laughs> and the topic today is why dana or giving is important. Okay, and we have with us our moderator this evening is none other than Uncle Vijaya. I think everybody knows him. Uh, uh, I've got a long um, bio of him. I don't think we. we okay, let's. Uncle says cut it short, so I'll do it short. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, this is Mr. Vijaya, Brother Vijaya, or Uncle Vijaya to most of us. Uh, he's a respected figure in the Buddhist community, uh, delivering countless number of inspiring Dhamma talks, most of the time quite funny, at the university schools and uh, Dhamma centers throughout Malaysia, as well as in Singapore and Australia, uh, spanning over six, uh, six decades. Um, in addition to his speaking engagements, he's also the patron of the Sasan Abhi Burdi Vardhana Society of Buddhist Mahavihara. And he's also served as the chairman of the Nalan Institute's uh, educational team. Uh, I don't need to tell about your retired life now and what you did before, and I think you everybody told already. I told already. <laughs> no, anyway, he was a senior lecturer at the University of Technology Mar uh, Malaysia, as well as a lecturer in drama and theater and public speaking and World Religions at the Taylor's College American Degree Program before he retired. So that's our moderator for this evening. Okay, our panelists, of course everyone knows Bhante Dr. Chandima. He's been here with us almost, I think, close to six months now, in and on, in and out. Uh, so Bhante uh, Dr. Gangodoy Bele Chandima is the Associate Editor of the Journal of International Buddhist Studies, JIBS, which is published by the Buddhist Research Institute of the Maha Chulalongkorn Raja Vidyalaya University of Thailand. And uh, he was previously a research fellow at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society at the, Uni at the University of Victoria in Canada. Uh, Bhante Chandima was also the Theravada Buddhist chaplain uh, at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in Canada from 2012 to 2016. Bhante runs, or rather he's an advisor of an online um, Dhamma organization called Patisota, which is very active. If you go online, uh, you can see Patisota, and Bhante is the senior advisor. And they conduct uh, weekly online Pali reading uh, classes, sutta classes. As a matter of fact, Bhante does a Monday sutta class here at the Buddhist Mahavihara every Monday without fail, whether physically being present or online. And also conducts Dhamma talks and a variety of other Dhamma activities. So without much ado, let me now invite both a moderator. I'll pass the mic to the moderator to start this evening's uh, Dhamma Shang. Uncle Vijay. Thank, thank you very much, <coughs> Brother Leslie. Uh, good evening, brothers and sisters. Namo Buddhaya. <coughs> uh, Bhante, greetings. Uh, this time I must admit I'm a little bit more comfortable because the last time we had a, a, a session that was when we discussed karma in BGF and there the arrangement was that Bante asks the questions and I answer. So, <laughs> and I was very, very uncomfortable about that. Okay, uh, but I've, I've come with a solution to that because uh, in a teacher relation uh, situation, the teacher can question the student to see how much the student knows. 
so I hope I passed the last time around. This time around, I'm a lot more comfortable because as a student, I want to ask the teacher a lot of questions, obviously on your behalf. And this time, last time was karma, this time we are discussing dana, okay, which is, I would like to know why dana is so relevant a topic. We don't hear other religions talking about dana. What, what is the relevance of dana to us? That, that's basically what we're going to do. We have about an hour where we will uh, discuss, and after that, we'll give you half an hour to ask questions, yeah? If you practice the principle of anatta, no personality, then you can write the question and we will read the question. <laughs> okay, uh, otherwise, you can ask the question, the uh, mic is over there, okay? Right, shall we start? Yeah, uh, Bante has already been introduced. Actually, there's a lot more about him, but we can find that out later, okay? And now the question is, uh, good evening, Bante. Good evening. And Bante, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to, to learn from you. Uh, you are obviously an international figure, and knowing from you, especially at such a young age, you have so much of knowledge, and if we can get all this knowledge together, it'll be very good for the uh, he, uh, uh, health of Buddhism. Today, as you all know, Venerable Chief was telling us, today is a very significant day. Uh, he said it's significant for Sri Lankans because that's the day the Buddha first visited Sri Lanka. He visited Sri Lanka three times. But in, on this first occasion, he sort of claimed Sri Lanka for Buddhism. Law, that barely nine months after he was uh, enlightened. So he was a very young man then. And he came and he knew that Sri Lanka was going to play a very important role in the spread of Buddhism. And through, through venerables, going all the way down to venerable Chandima, you know, uh, the monks have been responsible Sri Lankan monks have been responsible for bringing Theravada Buddhism uh, around the world. And today, thanks to technology and so on, in the old tradition, wearing the wearing something I always am very proud to talk about, yeah? The robe that the monk wears is the only piece of fashion that has not changed in 2,600 years. So Armani and Gucci, you can eat your heart out. <laughs> okay? But Bhante's uh, and the, the Sangha, the Sri Lanka Sangha, Theravada tradition, they have brought it down. And given the new developments that are going on in the world, we are very confident that with clear-minded speakers, who have a good command of, ve of foreign languages will be able to bring the Buddha's teaching even more directly. And we are today particularly fortunate in that we have an opportunity to learn more about Buddhism. Okay? And with that, Bhante, I'd like to start off with a very general question which has uh, bothered me. And, and ma many of my contemporaries who are working for the development of Buddhism in Malaysia. Uh, this is to do with people who are coming, who are new to Buddhism, who are new to Buddhism, and uh, they get frightened off. Malaysia, as you know, is a country where a lot of migrants have come, many cultural developments have taken place over the last 2,000 years. Right? And among them have been Buddhists from China, Buddhists from Tibet of late, and certainly Buddhists from Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka. So they've all come here, each bringing their cultural version of Buddhism. So when somebody comes in new to Buddhism, finds it all roja. 
Uh, I don't know how to explain rojak to you, but uh, it, it, it's a mixture of all kinds of things. And they want to know whether there is one Buddhism or there are many Buddhisms. And if they want to choose, which should they choose? And do these Buddhists, now Bhante, how can we, uh, how can we assure them that the Buddha only taught one Dhamma? And the cultural traditions w need not be thrown away. We might, it might be a source of strength. But how would you explain to such a person that there is but one Buddhism and it can be easily recognized? What are the common elements of Buddhism? My first question. Thank you, uh, Uncle Vijay. I did not feel that you were uncomfortable on that day, do. I was. Don't forget, I've got a master's degree in theatre. <laughs> <laughs> well, our first uh, discussion, which I uh, conducted, especially I interviewed you about uh, Buddhist karma, the working of Buddhist karma, and then we actually uh, uh, discussed from the basic level of karma and we went into the different aspects of karma too. Yeah. Anyways, now I know that what may have happened <laughs> <laughs> by that time. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, good evening, Dhamma friends. Uh, good evening, Uncle Vijay. It's an honor uh, uh, to be interviewed, to be uh, uh, asked questions from you. And you've been a very senior member over here. And looking at your question, uh, particularly on Malaysian aspect of Buddhism, I would take it as a general question. I yeah, mean, wherever right. you go, you, if you go to a Western country, if you go to any other country, other than a, primarily a Theravada country, we see different people pour in from different other countries. And then they uh, practice Buddhism in their own way, in their cultural way. So the shortest answer is, Many traditions, one teaching. Many traditions, one, one teaching. teaching. Now, if people think in your own wording, what did you call? Roja. Yeah. I don't know what it means. <laughs> if it is a salad, if it is a confusion, what I can say is that if somebody wants to learn uh, a, a more refined kind of Buddhism, kind of a very uh, more, I would say, uh, authentic type of Buddhism, mm. they can still try to learn early Buddhism, which is the shared common basis to all the other cultural Buddhist versions. If you uh, take um, Nikaya Buddhism in the canon, that is the common basis for Theravada, Mahayana, and all the other traditions, uh, be that in Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Western country, or another country. So the teaching is one fold, but there are many traditions, there are many fold, because they all try to assimilate onto the territory, that particular land, in their own way. But uh, as I think all, you may have all started your Buddhism from that cultural version of Buddhism. But then slowly you find out, no, there are certain things that I may have not picked up. So you go for a sutta class. And then you learn some uh, suttas from erudite uh, scholarly monks. So uh, overall what I can say is one teaching, many traditions. One teaching, many traditions. And so they can come in from any direction, but they will find a central piece there. Uh, yes. Just now I met this uh, brother and sister. They studied in, in New Zealand, right? But they didn't know Buddhism very well, but uh, they came through what Buddhists believe. The book. The book, what the Buddhists late believe. Late chief. Late chief, and late chief had also talked about this. What is common to us? Throw away the extraneous uh, things and go away. That, so thank you very much, Bhante. I think you sort of set the, the role uh, of what Buddhism plays in Malaysia. Let's go on to the, the question about uh, we are talking about today, yeah? More, more, more specific, yeah? Uh, what makes Buddhism unique as a religion? Meaning, there are so many religions in the world. Yeah? What, mm, why Buddhism? Why not some other religion? What, what is so special about saying, I am a Buddhist? Yeah? Others don't kill, don't steal, don't commit sexual misconduct, and so on. We also don't. So what's so special about us? I think, first of all, in my understanding, uh, 
we have to explain about what is religion and what is a philosophy yes. so to to me i feel like uh, a Buddh- buddhism is a way of life it might be neither a religion nor a philosophy because if you if you put buddhism into a religion uh, it would take the form of the abrahamic religious mm. uh, background one god and one thing and if it is a philosophy it might take the shape of other philosophies so but the question is interesting in the way that why buddhist teachings are more appealing to many people yeah, especially in the modern context in the modern context with a lot of uh, education yes yeah no more, lot of knowledge going on yeah yes uh, to me i think it is because buddhism widely talks about uh, uh, non violence uh, and uh, because you see a lot of wars have been started from the religions yes and absolutely. then they are mostly holy wars they call it religiously holy holy wars and um, uh, so on one side it's because of this widespread uh, uh, you know uh, non violence uh, which, which is a common which is a very hot topic uh, for the last couple of decades that's one thing second is certain bus words i would say the concept like mindfulness and mm. uh, and some other uh, ancillary concept like you know uh, we have to uh, you know worry about the uh, ecosystem uh, you know uh, global systems and so and so forth so there are uh, two sides one is uh, it is a it is a way to look at life uh, especially buddha talks about uh, dukkha in its uh, primary form and then talks about dukkha from the higher form Uh, but dukkha has been translated in a wrong way uh, by many uh, probably 17th 18th century scholars uh, i don't say they have purposely da- done it maybe it was they translated uh, yeah. uh, in the line of uh, bible probably uh, their command of the language command of the language by that time like a protest protestant kind of uh, english buddhist oh, yeah. language uh, on the other hand i think the non violence because when you talk about religion we feel like there are validated woes like attacks now you can see in the last couple of years too uh, we are not picking up any religion but we feel that when you when you go to the west and then if you ask a question what is your religion that's kind of a question like asking your age from a lady you know people don't like it yeah when you say religion private. yeah philosophy is more kind of a thing that people learn in a university so i think it's a way of life uh buddhism is more interesting because of uh, non-violence meditation uh, understanding life and looking within happiness within and spirituality it, uh, spirituality so there are many more to ways to uh, look at it yeah yes so you, you you would say that we are unique we do t- we do look at religion in a different perspective do you think that more and more people will come towards buddhism or will they say it's too high it's, this is not what religion needs to do for me religion needs to give me food on the table mm-hmm. yeah. i think there are people who are practicing buddhism that but they don't want to be identified as buddhist in the west uh, they may be christians but they practice meditation and all that uh, plus as uh, theravada culture we have some issues of attracting people yeah. because we are more rigorous about some rules and right. then especially the young people are walking away from the temple cultures in any temple <laughs> anywhere in the world because we are not attracting the philosophy is nice really nice philosophy but we don't know how to do so i always ask go to the church and learn th- from the church right. how to run uh some you know this kind of a nice thing you know bring it down to basics yes we the temples have their own ways of encouraging but when they come i mean they are our next generations who are going to you know uh supposed to uh, take up the role yeah uh, i think they are not very much welcome in the way that they think so uh although there is interest but on our side we have to do a lot uh, but there's a common interest because of those uh concepts non violence meditation all that You said we have to do a lot. We have to I think change the way how we operate probably uh you know uh, reach out to the people especially we are doing the same uh, olden ways uh, we might need to think uh, you know differently yeah. how to uh, how to uh, you know encourage those people out there 
to go beyond the cultural biases. Well, we can keep the culture, but our mindset probably. Maybe we are running temples like in 70s, 80s mindset. 1880s. <laughs> <laughs> we could go, we could go yeah, back. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, yes. So I think we have to we approach them. We need to them. modernize the approach. Modernize in a good way without, uh, you know, tarnishing the roots. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we can do it. It's still possible. Mm. I, I'm happy to note that uh, in Malaysia, at least, there are some uh, gr Buddhist groups which g empower the youth. They allow the youth to do it because we don't know what they want. They know what they want yeah. and they know how to do it. But I think one of the things that we haven't been able to do is for us, uh, for the older generation, especially the, the Sangha members, to sort of think how young people think and make Buddhism attractive to them. Yes. Yeah? And that, 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 that is the challenge. That is the challenge, that we need to empower the youths and give it to them. But trouble is, we empower the youths, they'll go overboard, and then we say, no, 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 this is not the freedom we are talking about. That's the, the problem we have. Okay, um, now we can come into our topic proper. Uh, would it be correct to say that dana is a very dana is a very important aspect of Buddhist practice? Uh, even going to the point of the most important, would you like to discuss whether it's important or the most important? Uh, does it co really compare with the concept of charity in other religions? Dana does dana simply mean giving? Mm. Like dukkha, dukkha has been wrongly translated. Mm -hmm. Dana has been translated as general. also wrongly translated. Also wrongly translated. All right. So yeah. let me so start. Don't worry about the youth. <laughs> worry about translation first. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, well, we have to admit, as the Buddha says, dana is the demos, or I would say, uh, the starting point of somebody's practice in Buddhism. Dana is the starting point. But the word dana has two meanings. One is very visible, the other one is implied. So the word D, long A, N, A, dana, you might see this is dana means giving. The implied meaning of dana is giving up. Ah, renunciation. But this giving up happens what you think while giving. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? So let's say somebody brings some, let's we start from a vihara, bring some offerings to the sangha, and then uh, they mostly look at what I'm gonna bring. But while, maybe before the person goes to do groceries, maybe come into the temple, that during time, and sorry, before time, and during time, after time, the kind of the thoughts that the, the, the donor is going to have relates to the giving up perspectives. Physically, we know that this person brings food and then uh, offers and then do whatever, whatever prayers and then go. So the word, Pali word dana has two meanings. One is visible, the other one is implied. So giving, uh, mainly giving, but during you give, you're going to give up. You're going to give up things both physically and mentally. So uh, that giving up is a meditation because you can't give up without purifying your thoughts. Somebody might say, I want to go for a retreat and then I will sit down. I'm on the cushion now. My meditation is only on the cushion, not off the cushion at that point. So it is a meditation also. It's a kind of a primary type of meditation because when you offer, if you cannot purify your thoughts from loba, dosa, moha, that means you are only uh, doing the giving part. Mm. That means you don't, you have not trained your mind, trained your thoughts to uh, free those thoughts from greed, hatred, and delusion, which are the primary things that anybody does uh, in a retreat. So it is the demos perspective, and uh, it is the starting point. It is not the starting point only. It is the practice that you have to carry on after starting off till you uh, pass away one day. So it's, it's very important. Even somebody comes to see the Buddha, Buddha talks about dana first, then sila, yeah, dana sila. then morality. Then he talks about uh, the dangers of karma, uh, sensual pleasures, unnecessary sensual pleasures. Then he talks about the importance of practicing renunciation. 
then he talks about four noble truths nowadays we see most of the dhamma talks start from the noble truths at the beginning mm. without talking about dana sila and this uh, gradual process because buddha knew without practicing dana nobody cannot practice dhamma uh, to an extent that that person understand the four noble truths and if i make a connection to our dhamma path in the proper teachings you might be wondering where does dana fit in in the noble eightfold path because our dhamma absolutely. journey is noble eightfold path let's see the samadhi panya ah, samadhi ti samma sankap and all yeah. these uh, eight uh, noble path factors according to the samadhi ti samadhi ti has 10 parts uh, the first couple of parts represent giving samadhi ti meaning right view right view Uh, right four of the right view. there are 10 top 10 uh, types of right views uh, three or four out of those 10 are about uh, believing in dana believing in small offering believing in large offerings as such that means dana is a part of our right view without that right view we cannot go to the next level that means right intention right speech and all that so it is the demos practice the right orientation you get the yeah right orientation we are not disoriented we are oriented on dana mm. now when we say dana we have to keep it going on the side let's say you go to samma sankap samma vacha maybe you speak good words maybe you meditate but uh, dana has to be on the loop on the side of your practice you never give up dana because while giving you have to give up whatever you are giving and whatever the thoughts of Uh, greed hatred delusion that are happening to you and the other question you are making is charity uh, yes mm. charity definite if dana is the starting point then charity would be a way that somebody is going to be generous towards uh, other causes other uh, you know important causes i would say uh, for a uh, good cause somebody can come up with uh, a charity campaign yes so they are all connected can you explain to us uh, the three divisions of types of dana amisa dana uh, what amisa dana patipatti patipatti dana uh, abhaya dana dhamma dana ah very interesting the, 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 those four can you please g- now amisa this is important to us because when we practice we need to know what is it that we are uh, actually uh, amisa dana we call it uh, amisa puja also amisa ah, means the, the normal offerings that people material. do to sangha or other people patipatti is a puja actually it's not a dana patipatti means practicing the dhamma according to how the buddha said and then uh, what do you call abhaya dana means it's very interesting that means we are giving what do you call uh, fearlessness fearlessness to other people when you are with some people you feel like very intimidated you feel like threatened so you are always talking in a way the other person feels uh, secure uh, you know i feel secure when you when i'm with you uh, so we are giving that security to other people also we might go to a, uh, a bigger thing like we go to certain places and then release certain animals cows and all these animal like fish in your chinese culture right those kind of stuff uh, that is what you call abhedana dhamma dana is the highest dana in buddhism let me explain that with the stanza yeah. uh, which was given by the buddha each dana carries certain results i don't take this for granted huh? but i just share with you annado balado hoti vattado hoti vannado ya yanado sukado hoti deepado hoti chakkudo socha sabba dado hoti yo dadati upasaya amatan dado cha so hoti yo dhamma manusasa this is a stanza appears in the sangyutta nikaya right about dana the buddha says if you offer food you will be physically strong mm. this is the result that means if you are physically weak you have to think about <laughs> giving mm. more danas yeah. right physically and mentally of course and then vattado hoti vannado if you are not pretty enough handsome enough it is because you haven't offered given oh, clothings to the other the results people. of the wrong kind of dana yeah so th- now this specifies to certain items about dana then yana do sukha do hoti if you have offered if you have given a right to somebody if you have offered certain vehicles that means you are you are getting uh, some comfort or overall comfort 
Now, don't think that if you don't get a right, that means you haven't given anything <laughs> <laughs> in a past life. <laughs> Anyways, and then deepado hoti chakkudo, if you have not, if you have offered, given light candles and all these things, you get good eyesight. Your eyesight uh, works well, and then uh, uh, you get everything if you offer a place to somebody, shelter to somebody, and if you offer. If you share dhamma with somebody or with a group of people, uh, other people, that means you are giving like ambrosia, like nectar, which is supposed to be uh, consumed by the devas. So, sabbadanang dhamma danang jinati. Yeah. Out of all the danas, dhamma dana excels. Uh, so, I think the problem here is that when people hear this thing, they forget about. They they might think, I don't want to do the physical dana anymore. Mm -hmm. I only publish books. I print books. I want to share dhamma things. I'm going to stop my uh, physical dana. Yeah. So you have to simultaneously do all these things, giving physical dana, publishing, printing. But the Buddha said on a scale of dana, uh, you know, sharing dhamma, giving dhamma, printing dhamma things. In today's world, we don't print books a lot, right? Because uh, it's not uh, that timing. We don't print a lot because we have lots of digital space mm -hmm. nowadays. But if you share Dhamma, if you uh, let somebody know the true Dhamma, that is the highest Dhamma. So in this way, Dhamma uh, can work on a different scale. But I uh, tell you in a kind way that do not pick one or the other. Try to practice all forms of Dhamma. Because otherwise you'll be uh, okay on one side, you'll be not okay on other side. Locked side. Yeah. Yes, you might be blind, but you get all the other things. Yeah. You may be deaf, you get all the other things. Yeah. So we have to practice everything simultaneously. So dana is the demos, the starting point. But once you start, don't forget, keep it on the loop, on the side, and do other all the virtues. Which leads me to the next question: uh, Is dam, dana alone enough to gain enlightenment? What is our, f our, because when we look at the life of the Bodhisattva, mm -hmm. so much of it was based on dana, giving, mm -hmm. renunciation. Can this one thing, can I concentrate on dana and become a Buddha? Dana? Yeah, very interesting question. Actually, the Buddha fulfilled paramitas. Yeah. Uh, dana is only one of them. The first. So. Yeah. First virtue. Actually, uh, bodhisattvas are practicing paramitas in 30 ways. Pacheka Buddhas practice oh. the paramita in 20 yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. Arahans practice paramitas in 10 yeah, ways. I think people yeah. mistakenly understand that there are only 10 paramitas. Let me tell you. Dana, Sila, Nekham, uh, Panya, Virya, Kanti, Satcha, Aditana, Metta, Upekka. Ten these names are, these are the ten, ten virtues that the Buddha uh, practiced. Bodhisattva practiced before he became a Buddha. Yeah. Which we call paramis. Paramitas. Mahayana has a different version. Uh, Theravada has a different version. So, uh, now when it goes to dana, Bodhisattvas practice dana in three ways. Not only in one way. Dana parami, dana upaparami, dana paramatta parami. Let me explain to you. Mm, yeah, please. Dana parami means we call in Pali, Bahira Banda Parichagu Dana Parami Unam. If somebody Be, can. Before that, sorry, Bhante. What does Parami mean? Uh, parami means the fruition of that virtue. Now we practice virtue, sila, meditation, bhavana, but we don't go to the fruition. The pinnacle of that particular virtue is the Parami. When you go to the pinnacle, you fulfill the Paramita. The, the highest yeah, level. It's important we know that. Parami. We practice on a different scale. Maybe we are not going that much. We are just going here and there, like a neutral car, you know, go yeah. here and come back. Yeah. So, uh, parami is that. So, each parami, now, uh, bodhisattvas practice each parami in three ways, making it to 30. Now, we pick up dana. Dana parami means giving external things, food and those things, what you can Aam give to. Amisa. Mostly amisa. Like what our people also do, mostly our devotees also do. Dana upaparami means anga parichago nama dana upaparami nama. That means if somebody can do an organ donation, mm -hmm. including a blood donation, that is anga parami, dana upaparami, which, no, no, which not everybody can do. Right? Even though you might like it, but you are not physically strong to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, organ donation, probably a blood donation, and that kind of. 
the kind of dhanas, like a uh, step further than that. Then the last section of dhana is dhana paramatta parami. That means jivita parichagu, risking the life somebody is trying to help out somebody. Like when the Buddha jumped off, I mean Bodhisattva jumped off the cliff ah. to feed the hungry tigress. Ah, that's a Mahayana version. The, uh, Mah Mahayana version. version of that. Our version is the rabbit. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Sasajataka. Oh, I like think that's a beautiful story. <laughs> I think you should share that with them. All right. So Why the full moon has a rabbit. Yes, that's interesting and it's funny too in a way. Yeah. So the rabbit was a bodhisattva. So the Sakha, the head god, wanted to test the rabbit's sacrifice. So he came in and he said, I didn't eat food for many days. Then uh, the rabbit was very compassionate. Yeah. We became awkward with the kindness. He said, I'm going to jump. And then he jumped, the Sakha, uh, you know. Saved him. Uh, saved him, but then some, uh, uh, probably some interpreters say Sakha brought the rabbit onto the moon. <laughs> oh. Oh, squeeze, I, <laughs> and I, making that the uh, moon has a rabbit, but it's, it's not. Yeah. The so, version I heard was he uh, squeezed uh, a mountain, took uh -huh. the juice and painted the Yeah, the that's, that's another interpretation. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> that is the, I mean, that is the version how we understand Dana Paramatta Parmi. Yeah. But in our normal life, Dana Paramatta Parami, to my understanding, is you are going to sacrifice probably your life for a worthy good cause. But I advise don't do that <laughs> because mm. that's a dangerous thing. It's not that you're going to take life uh, like uh, many frustrated uh, young people do. Mm. It's not that kind of a thing. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is very relevant to a bodhisattva only. So, it is the bodhisattva sacrifice in order to go to the fruition of the dana. So, in this case, we understand dana paramita has been fulfilled by a bodhisattva in three ways. If you are going to be a Pachyaka Buddha, you only fulfill the first two. If you are going to be an arahant, you only fulfill the first paramita, that means dana parami, only giving offerings. So, all this, uh, you know, uh, tell these us are, to understand. These are three levels of Buddha. Dana. Three levels of Buddhahood, the lowest... Not Buddhahood, three levels of Paramita. There are three levels of Paramita. Inside the Paramita. And that leads to Buddhahood. Yeah, when you fulfill the three levels only, then uh, you are <coughs> going to fulfill the rest of the nine in three ways also. Sila Parami, Sila Parami, Sila Paramatta Parami. Let me explain to you. Yeah, please. Now, when someone practices certain precepts, certain uh, disciplinary things, that person practices sila parami. When someone risk jeopardizes one's own limbs and organs, but yeah. still that person wants to practice sila, that is sila paparami. When someone is to practice sila even by sacrificing one's life, that is sila paramatta parami. Yeah. This is how the bodhisattvas practice Paramita. Now our conversation is about dana. dana so yeah. dana is the demost thing. Dana is the starting point. We have to keep it uh, going all the time while we are practicing other yeah. virtues. Um, they say that dana comes first because it's the easiest of all the paramis to perform. Malaysians are very good at dana, not so good in meditation. <laughs> because it's... Uh, uh, would you agree that uh, dana I don't think, is let me, the easiest? Let me tell you a story. Uh, there is, a, I think, Sutta or a Jataka story where a king is going to see a man who is swallowing the swords. 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 Oh. He's swallowing a couple swords. Oh. So the king was telling the Purohita, the minister next to him, see that guy is swallowing swords. Must be a very <laughs> difficult yeah, task. Yeah. And the Purohita is telling him, giving dana, and then uh, looking at dana after the dana is more difficult than swallowing a sword. Oh, you because got that one? The, the it's true more dana. difficult to swallow uh, s sword. More than, more than. More, more than that, it's, it is to give dana. That means people don't know the true dana. That is why this question arises. That means the true dana is how you purify your mind for before, during, after the dana. If, if any thought comes to you, oh, I missed that, I could have given to somebody else, my money I wasted, because these thoughts right, are right, 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 right. hanging here and there, you know? Yeah. Once this thought uh, takes you over, 
the, the, the result of dana is going to be minimized, diminished. That's why uh, even so uh, being happy after the dana is more difficult than swallowing couples' thoughts. You know, I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's difficult. I think, I think the way people think that dana is easy is that they buy something and they go to a vihara and then often come back. It's not, it's just one aspect of dana. But there are a lot of things to do, especially purification. Yeah. Your mind has to be pure. Uh, you should not have a loba thought, dosa thought, moha thought. A lot of people, they do it before, during. But after dana, they do the post-mortem. That is when things are going, uh, you know, a topsy-turvy yeah. point, yes. Or even when giving, they say, why not give the number one quality, may as well give number two quality, you know. <laughs> and and the, the attitude towards the monk, they, they're eating all the time. Those kind of things, we need to purify the mind. Purifying the mind, that's the difference. That is the purpose of dana. That's the purpose. That is that. difficult. Yes, difficult than we think. Yes. It's not just giving, it's not insurance policy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, leading on from where we were, the Buddhist path is sometimes divided into sila, samadhi, panya. And I think in the Mahayana tradition more, dana, sila, uh, uh, dana, sila, bhavana. So it's sila, samadhi, panya, which we, uh, there is, uh, sila, what, uh, uh, virtue, uh, concentration of the mind, and wisdom. That's the Eightfold Path, which we Theravadins follow, all right? But there's another path which says it's uh, Dana, Sila, Panya, Bhavana. Dana is, comes first. Now, my question to Bhante is, uh, why is ban, uh, Dana in the first one and dropped in the second one? Does that imply that Dana is less important? Why Let, doesn't it appear in both? In order to answer this question, we have to go to the suttas. Now, the Noble Eightfold Path is our path. The Noble Eightfold Path is included in the Sila Samadhi Panya practice. Yes. So, according to the Noble Eightfold Path, Panya comes first, Sila being the second, and then uh, Samadhi is the third, Lofty Panya is the fourth. So, Panya, Sila, Samadhi, Panya. That is how we have to take it. But Sila, Samadhi, Panya... Please repeat. I make it four, yeah. just to explain. Important. Let me, let me explain yeah, to you. Yeah. Before we take Sila, before we do Dana, we have to know why we are doing that. Panya we need a bit of wisdom for that. Now I always ask people a very simple uh, scenario. Take, for instance, a three months old infant a three months old infant, who does not kill, who does not steal, who does not know any idea of sexuality, yeah. no misbehaving at all, who does not lie, who does not take anything, uh, beverages or food to cloud the mind. Then of course, the three months old baby should be very virtuous, should have a lot of seal, isn't it? Hmm. Isn't it? No. Uh, mere avoidance of the precept is not seal. Seal is the intentional avoidance of the precepts. Now, for us, we don't kill because we know it's not good for me, my karma, and for that person's life. And we don't steal. We know how precious uh, about how other people have earned their stuff. Not good for me, not good for others. And you know why you should not engage in sexual misconduct. You might end up with a divorce. You might have broken relationships in your future it lives. Hurt other people. Yeah, I mean, you should not step over to other people's relationships. So, because you understand the consequences, so you are not doing as such. So, in the same way, we have to understand, we need, we need this panya, this wisdom, this, this what you call a general panya about why we are doing sila. That's why the Buddha said, samma ditti, samma sankapa comes for it, which is not sila, which is panya, ditti. The first two of the Noble Eightfold yeah, Path, they belong to Panya, not seal. Right, right. That's why. So this order must be changed because this is how the Buddha said. So the way how, the, what you call, later on commentarians and the writers uh, put them, was, put them uh, was according to seal Samadhi Panya. That's why a lot of people, they struggle. They, they are always with seal. They never go to Samadhi. Mm. 
right? Yeah. They only practice sila only. They don't, they don't know what is the connection. And then, uh, let me explain the other panya. So when you have a, a general knowledge of uh, the other uh, things, other sub small virtues, why you are doing such, then you are going on to sila. Then you are going on to samadhi. Oh. Then you are reaching that lofty panya, the expanded panya, where you attain nibbana. So, so, so the order should be... You start with a little bit of wisdom. Little bit of panya. And then you go to That panya the, is not that lofty panya. Right. That panya means you have to know why we are doing this. Yeah. I mean, we have so to do that. Wisdom <laughs> leads to wisdom. Yeah, yeah. So probably a, a minimal version of wisdom, that leads to sila. And that sila leads to samadhi. And overall leads to... Panya. panya. So, Panya, Asila, Samadhi, Panya. That's yes. how uh, so. the Buddha has given in the yeah. Suttas, Mahachattara is a Sutta, Majjhimanikai 117. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Bhante. Um, while we are at it, I, this is my, actually my last question, but you mentioned intention. Can intention. you please explain to us the importance of intention in, in all our Buddhist practice, mm. not just... All right. This is also one of the largely misunderstood, uh, uh, I think, uh, concepts, I would say. Now, uh, I think you are mostly referring this to Kamma, be mm. because uh, the Buddha says, Chetanaham bhikkave kammang vadami, cheta itva kammang karoti kaya navachaya manasa, angutra nikaya nibbedika pariyaya sutta. The Buddha says, mere action is not karma. In Hinduism, mere action is karma. See the difference? In Buddhism, no. Action uh, supported with an intention, I would say volition, is karma. That means you might be stepping uh, over here. You might be uh, stepping onto tiny creatures which you don't see. Uh, but if you know that there are tiny creatures, you are making good, make bad karma. But if you don't know, then you are not making bad karma. So there is a volition. We call it chetana. Then sankappa is intention. So sankappa and uh, what is sankappa is intention. Then chetana is volition. Chetana is with kam. Intention is the second noble path factor in the noble eightfold path. The Buddha right. says we have to come up with right intentions. How do we come up with right intentions? Only when we have samadhiti. Because if you don't have samadhiti, then you don't have the next one too. The panya comes first. Huh? Panya is before that. Yeah. Some, normally, Anya gives you ditti, samma ditti. Yeah, samma ditti and samma sankapa both represent that minimal version of wisdom. Both. Okay, okay, they are okay, they okay. taken together. Anya. Normally, when you have yoniso manasikara, mm. wise attention, you are going to, you are able to practice samma ditti and samma sankapa. So samma sankapa means right intentions. You will have right intentions only if you have right view. Right intentions are threefold. Nekkamma Sankappa. Intentions about renunciation. Ah, that's where it goes ah. back to the beginning of our discussion. Renunciation is also dana. Once again. Renunciation is dana. Because okay. you have to renounce your sensual world. It's a it's a dana. It's not easy. And giving up. You might give uh, food and but you are not able to renounce your whole sensual world easily. You might do, it takes yeah. time. Yeah. The second uh, intention is Avyapada Sankappa. Hmm. Intentions on non ill will. Because today's world, people are so much, uh, you know, uh, bombarded. Caught up with hate and... Yeah, ill will, if you see internet, yeah. right? And there are, there are lots of cursing happening. Mm. And the third thing is, third intention is, avihinsa uh, sankap. Intentions on non-violence. I would say non-bullying, you know. People bully other people all the time, you know. Pick, pick on other people. So you are creating intentions not to bully other people. Try to uh, give them abedana, you know, uh, security. Fearlessness. Right? Yes, fearlessness. So that is how we see the intention. It's very important. You won't develop intentions, nekkama sankappa, renunciation intentions, or avyapada sankappa, non ill will intentions, or avihinsa sankappa, non bully, non harassing intentions, if you don't, did not start the practice from samaditi. When you have samaditi, all the transformation happens from that point onwards. You know what just went through my mind? Before this morning, Bhante contacted me and he said, before I, we start, we should announce that those who attend today's forum uh, should have some previous knowledge 
or have, have at least read something about Buddhism. I assume that you have. <laughs> I, I apologize a bit late. <laughs> you could have gone home an hour earlier. But, but I hope not. I hope Abante brought it down to that level where we I could think, I think the I think I simplified. I, I, I don't think, think that I, I, yes. I think it was quite clear. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's bringing us quite close to 9.30. Go now. My next question would be something which we Malaysians generally, I think we, we subscribe to this idea that I do good. My father who died was a terrible fellow. Uh, I, I hated him, I'm glad he died and now he's gone. However, let me do a lot of good deeds now and transfer merits to him. Is that possible? Yes. The whole concept of uh, 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 transferring merits and who in the other world can benefit from this kind of activity? Two questions. So this leads to a question about merit transference initially. Merit but, transference. But I would, I would say this. Uh, in Buddhism, there is a way how to neutralize the bad karma. Mm. That was my research at the university too. Oh, so okay. At the University of yeah. Victoria. Yeah. So I did a, a research on neutralizing bad karma within Theravada Buddhism in 2017, one year. So uh, if you look up certain suttas, especially if you narrow down to certain suttas, you would see that there are a lot of stories, a lot of teachings wherein the Buddha talks about some bad karmas can be mitigated, weakened, or neutralized. But don't take this for granted. Huh? I can do a bad karma and then now I have, now Bhante is saying Sorry, that. sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is for the bad karma you may have done before. Now you are a good person. You are a good person now. We, we may all have a bad life in the past, more or less. So the Buddha says it is just as an example. He asks us to think about, suppose there is someone who put a small amount of salt mm. into a cup of water, tumbler. Mm. The cup of water will become salty, very, very salty, saltish yeah. uh, in a, min a minute of time, yeah. less than that time. So the same person is going to bring the same amount of salt into the Ganges in India. Will no, the, will the Ganges effect. River become saltish in that no. uh, short time? No, because the vo volume of the water in Ganges is uh, voluminous yeah. than the uh, water in the cup of water. Yeah. In the same way, if somebody has done lots of good karmas, dana, sila, bhavana, patti, pattan, all these ten good karmas, paramitas, kusalas, that person must have created lots of good karmas, like a shield. Right? Right. So those good karmas will, go, will be, I would say, uh, taking over the bad karmas. But there are five or six bad karmas you cannot Heinous neutralize. Crimes. Heinous karmas, like killing mother, killing father, uh, killing arahants, Buddha, Buddha. Uh, making issues among Sangha, Sangha members, and then following a teacher who is not teaching you how to end the Dukkha. That is also a heinous karma. <laughs> you follow yeah, teachers. So. Right? So, uh, the Buddha said, yes, there is a way. So, now, as for the father, in your example, who may be a bad fellow, it's his own good karma, bad karma. Now there is a son or a daughter, because just because my father was a bad fellow, I cannot separate from him, right? Yeah. Because that was only my father. So now I have to do good karmas. Now you are asking how to do it, whether it is receivable, transferable. Mm. It, now I go to another sutta. This is, this is uh, given in the Anguttara Nikaya. One Brahmin approached the Buddha one day and asked a question, the same question. Yes, Bhante, we, our people, we are doing lots of dana. Uh, can you tell me whether our Jnati Peta, mm. our departed ones, really receive, receive this good karma? Then the Buddha said, no, all these people, Opadana, they never ask this question. Okay. <laughs> they open, then they go. <laughs> Very good question. Then the Buddha said, depends on the place where your departed ah. one was reborn. The window. Ah. So he talks about three places where your departed one cannot take merits now at this point and he talks about one particular place uh, if that departed one is reborn there he or she can take three uh, places where the departed one cannot take let's say somebody's father passed away 
he was reborn as a human again. He cannot take the merits or she cannot take merits now mm. because humans have, in order to become a human, you must have done an enormous good karma. That's why I always say to people, you are very worried about the next life, whether you will become an animal or uh, this and that. Think about what you might have done in last life. You must have done, done a good karma. So you have the influence. You have the experience. Just continue your good things. So if your relative became a human, then that person cannot take good karmas now, at this point. If your relative became a deva, one of the six deva world also cannot take good karma. Devas don't need good need. karmas. It doesn't need. Yeah. Devas don't need good karmas. <coughs> then you might ask, then why do we give good karmas for devas at the end? It is because we want to minimize our selfishness. Otherwise, people might think, I meditate, I do good karma, so I am good, I am happy, I am the best one. <laughs> mm. In order to minimize your selfishness, we are sharing. But they don't need initiating. And then, if your departed one was reborn as an as, a, as a, an animal, then that person cannot take good karmas now. Let's say your department became a cat or a dog. Or a ghost. Or, or a yeah, dog. yeah, animal or a ghost, you, they cannot until they finish. Then the Buddha talks about the only one place that these good karmas can be transferable and then receivable now at this point, while they are doing the dana time. There's one place called Paradattu Pajivi, a peta world Small. that is uh, subsisted on the good karmas that are uh, sent from the previous life people. It's like a transit. You don't, tra you don't stay longer in a transit. Huh? You need a visa. Yeah. Right? You, have to, you must go to another place. This is, there are four peta world. Nijjama Tannika, Kuppi Pasa, Paradattu Pajivi, Pansupisa. Paradattu Pajivi. So only if the departed one was reborn there and waiting for the good karmas, uh, these good karmas are instantaneously going to that person. Then the Brahmin was not happy. Oh. Okay. Because then Bhante, uh, we don't know uh, our relative might be reborn in this place. Then don't worry. That means, let's say your departed one became a deva, human, uh, maybe a hellish being. They might not be able to take it now. But as time goes on, oh. there will be a time that they can take those good karma. So they will be deposited. They will be kept in deposit. Kept in, yes, deposited. Oh. <laughs> in their own karmic, karmic yeah. ways. Yeah. But it's not wasted. That's ah, that's what important. the Buddha wants to say. They are not wasted. Yeah. Cloud is huh? kept in the cloud. <laughs> see, see he's, he's getting it to talk with the youths. Youths will understand that language. <laughs> Mine is where rain comes from, that's all. Ah, that's beautiful because I've exhausted my questions. It's 9.30, yes. and now I think you may have questions to ask. And uh, you would like to ask some questions? Yes, we can give a mic to them. Huh? The mic is there, yeah. Bhante. Anyone? Yes, sir. <coughs> Bhante, should I have some water? No, no, it's for you. Mine is there. Bhante. Question. I think you haven't turned on the mic. Oh. Take the wireless one, wireless one behind you. Okay, okay Bhante, I got one question. Um, you talk about intention for during the giving, right? Uh, I think I come across like eight kind of intention. And the last part is like, uh, giving, f I, I read here, I can't remember the word. Okay. One give a gift for the purpose of ornamenting the mind. What does it mean? I don't know what kind of source you are referring to. Okay, I can give you the source. Uh, Patama Dana Sutta. Ah? Patama Dhamma Sutta. Ah, okay. Patama yes. Dana Sutta. They got okay. eight there. Yeah, can you repeat? That first one, first intention again? Somebody first. gives dana. Okay, for? the first one. The first one, is it? Yeah. Okay. Having insulted the recipient, one give a gift. That is the first one. Yeah. Second one, one give a gift from fear. Mm -hmm. Third one, one give a gift thinking he gave to me. The fourth one, one give a gift thinking he will give to me. He 
gave to me, he will All give All these are wrong me. ways of doing dana, yeah. wrong intentions. So yeah. you can keep going, the list. Okay, number five. Uh, one give a gift thinking giving is good. Uh, number six. One giving a gift thinking I cook. These people do not cook. Okay, number... It uh, then continue. It isn't right that I who cook should not give to those who do not cook. Okay, cook. Is, cook. 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 Okay. Number seven. One give a gift thinking because I have given this gift, I will gain good reputation. Okay. And the last one. One give a gift for the purpose of ornamenting the mind. All right. Uh, th these are going to be uh, these are going to be what you call hindrances to the proper intention when you're giving dana one day. But I think most of the devotees start from one of these. Normally they start from one of so we cannot blame anybody thinking a lot of people might say dana is good, dana is good. So I had to go to temple. So I don't I don't say that like the the initial efforts from a donor. Like when they come to the temple for the first time, they look at, ah, these are wearing robes. They are just getting, keeping up with the culture, keeping up with the temple procedure. So one day, they must go to this level in their dana practice. So that should be the plan. Uh, not that every, every devotee, every donor has to right away practice uh, the opposite of these eight. But this is the ideal state of intentions in regard to the dana. So that's, that's, that's what uh, we understand from these eight. But initially devotees come just to have their own personal thoughts. Sometimes it entails tanha, <laughs> bhava tanha, and then... Uh, now even see, ornamenting my mind, which means just to clarify my mind too. So the, uh, donors have uh, these eight in different ways, but when they know more dhamma, they will change. They will fix their mind to this level. That is what I can say about it. This is one of the high, ideal ways of thinking about that. That's what is meant by ornamenting the mind. That's a final purification of the mind. That's the highest. But all the others, Bhante says, practice it, but that's not the ideal. So I think different people start dana differently. So when they practice, uh, slowly they will understand these eight mm. and then uh, come to the right side of the dana. But we value everybody's dana, right? Now think about uh, Amba Pali, the prostitutes at the Buddha's time. She offered the Amba Vana. Buddha never said, ah, bad money, you know, unethical money. Hmm. He never said, you earn the money in bad ways. No, he, he accepted the Amba Vana. And the offerings given by Adhakasi, another prostitute, he accepted. So I think uh, while we're learning certain suttas, we have to understand the stories also. I mean, the Buddha's real life, how mm. he managed dana. <laughs> uh, is giving uh, to the bhikkhu more better than giving to others? Giving to whom? Bhikkhus. And uh, the one day is uh, more important than giving to others? Which well, is a better investment. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> okay, two ways to look at it. T two ways to look at it. Let me, let me answer your question in two ways. Now, why our devotees are only looking for Sangha? Normally we understand if you want to offer, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, do something for your departed ones, you, your favorite part is finding a temple and yeah. offering dana because you understand Sangha is more virtuous than others. That is how people approach Sangha. But when you take dana as a practice, you cannot only include Sangha within that. So I always say you have to make every moment an opportunity to be generous. You have to make every opportunity to be generous. That this is what we understand about the dana concept uh, in Buddhist stage. I will explain in two uh, examples. There's a sutta called Velama Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya, mm. where is a Brahmin asked the Buddha, how is the scaling up 
of the dana. Like if you do this dana, that fields dana, this dana. Merit. Yeah, scaling. The fields of merit. Yes, and yeah. then which dana is higher? Then Buddha says, if you offer something to a cat, an animal, an animal, you get the benefit for 100,000 lives. If you give some food to an animal, you get it for 100,000. You, you multiply the results spanning across 100,000 lives. Then what about a, a dusila man, non-virtuous human, maybe a criminal, but he's a human. When you offer something to a human, although that human has no sila, that is more important than, more Even beneficial than giving to an animal, because he's a human. And then the Buddha keeps giving the list. Then Sotapanna person, Sakadagami person, uh, Anagami person, Arahan person, Pacheka Buddha, then Samma Sambuddha. Then the Brahmin was happy, it, thinking it could be the end. Giving uh, food to the Buddha is the end. Buddha said no. Giving dana uh, to the Sangha is more, more beneficial because Sangha is a community. And the list did not stop. If somebody can practice metta for a moment, mm. that is more beneficial than practicing dana. And even more than metta, if somebody can practice as anicca sanya, impermanence, that is more beneficial. Now, when we share this thing, uh, unwise people might catch up only one thing out of this list. What I'm saying is that you are uh, with animals, pets. You are with different humans. You are with different other spiritual categories. Try to practice dana evenly, evenly. Like when you only eat herbs, you might get sick. When you only eat meat, you get sick. So when you eat, you have, should have a balanced diet. In the same way, practice dana whenever possible with any uh, recipient. That is the way how the Buddha asks us to practice. Uh, people choose sangha for a, a specific cause when they want to offer something to sangha uh, in memory of their departed ones. Mm -hmm. Other than that, that should not affect our general practice of dana. You don't come to Vihara all the time and offer, but we have our uh, dana practice uh, as a normal practice. Let's say you smile with somebody, you share your knowledge, you do volunteer. All these are dhanas. You give time to somebody. So we have to practice that dhana uh, without making sangha as a problem in our life. So that is how we have to understand it. But so make every moment an opportunity <coughs> to be generous. But can you please explain a little bit about Sangika dana, the, the practice of Sangika? We do that every time mm. as a dana, a little verse. Maybe Sangika dana means that you are offering to uh, uh, XYZ number of monks, but your thoughts have to go back to the Buddha's time. Any Sangha lived at that time, and any Sangha who, who is living now across the world, and any Sangha that will that be future come. Sangha. So when you offer to two monks, three monks, five monks in a Vihara, your mind should always go to these three types of monks. But if you only think, ah, I offer dana to five monks at Buddhist Mahavihara, the results of dana will be diminished, minimized. Because the kusala will be started depending on those monks' virtues. You are offering to them, but when you are offering, you have to think that I am giving this dana to all those monks who lived at the Buddha's time. All the monks who are living far and wide. All the monks will be monks in the future. For all these three times of monks. So that is how we're going to do a Sangika Dana. Sangika Dana is not one, two, three, four, seven, thirty, hundred monks. Sangika Dana means you choose the monks according to the place, according to the time situation, but your thoughts are going to those three types of monks. That is Sangika Dana. Is there, is there a, a f number, a particular number that you can... The there, uh, there is no number for making dana sangi, but if you do a vinaya kamma only, we need four monks, four, four pasampada monks. But for a uh, sangi dana, because that devotee has to think about all these sangha, so you don't need a number. Now, in this example, the devotee has to think, of, you may have one pasampada monk with you, Hyodian monk, but your mind has to go to all those sangha members. So you have all so it monks. opens up. Completely. Yes. So you, don't, should, uh, you shouldn't be worried about the number then, at that point. Thank you, sir, for that question. Any more questions? Uh, Bante, uh, I have three questions here. 
Question number one is, is the practice of releasing birds, fish, and also other animals, is a good practice of uh, dana? Can you repeat that question, please? Okay. Is the practice of releasing birds, releasing birds, okay. fishes, and also other animals, is a good practice of dana? Yes, there's no question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if so, uh, wouldn't that it actually encourage the trading of animals? Like we buy, then we just release it. Isn't that the encourage the, the trading mm. of animals? Mm. Yeah, okay. which is like it falls under the um, not a good practice. Yeah. Got the question. Would you rephrase the question? Yeah, so the question is that you know by having this idea of releasing birds, you're actually creating a situation where people catch birds to release them on Vesak Day and the poor birds suffer even more. Yeah. So is that encouraged? Can, yeah, can there that? are certain practices, like you said, releasing uh, different animals. Like in Sri Lanka, people say when you release a cow, the other cow is going to be the next. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the cow who was uh, 10 cows away will be the next to be killed. Right? So people have those thoughts. Right? So um, I probably think uh, these are ways to help out, but these actions might lead to certain complications, like you said. So then you have to think about a better way to, better way to practice dana. Okay. Yes. Uh, in your example, you might uh, pick birds. Uh, so you have to think about uh, better ways. Uh, in not having remorse, regret, but at the same time, I do my dana. Sometimes when you do some danas, you feel not happy at the end. Yeah. So that means your purpose, uh, you know, is affected in that way. Yeah. So when you are in doubt, don't. Yes. Basically. Yes. Right. Buddha said in one place, yeah. uh, you should give dana to people uh, that you are happy with. Mm -hmm. it should right? bring because when you are not happy, you should not give that dana because because you are struggling within your mind so you have not you don't have low you don't have alobado samoha dana sila met dana metta panya so i think uh, you can think about better ways to give better ways to release maybe you can uh, you know uh, search more about this uh, releasing from different places right uh, you know there may be more uh, uh, disciplined places yeah maybe more professional people who might be doing this thing in a different yeah. way yeah Probably you can uh, check with them too. Yeah. Uh, please, Bhante, uh, allow me to share with you what happened 30, 40 years ago here. People were doing this in this temple. And our late chief put a stop to it. He said, on Vesak Day, no birds, no animals will be released in this area. And oh, they were furious because they said, what right does he have to tell us? But put that discipline down. Now you never have Vesak Day, we don't have releasing. What we encourage is, go to the jungle. Take these birds on off days. Vesak Day, people do it in order to create a thing. So go on a, another day, on an anniversary of a relative's death or what, buy these animals, go to the jungle and release them. So that way you are not using Buddhist uh, important days in order to create suffering for the animals. Okay. Maybe animals are more safe. In the animals way. are safe. More safe. They are in their area. Auntie Tan, I don't know if you know, she used to do that on a regular basis. She used to collect money and then go and go to the market, buy frogs. The frogs are some supposed to be very tasty. Uh, <laughs> go and catch them and release them in uh, Tamantunde that area. So that's, there are ways, wise ways of doing this. I think the action is good, should be done in a oh, good way. Definitely. Proper way. That is abeya, giving fearlessness. Okay, one more question. All right, um, my second question is, uh, this happened like a couple of years ago, I think very, very um, long time ago. So when I was a student, uh, I used to go to temples to offer dana, so I just like, you know, cut some fruits and also like bring someone of cooked food. So every time I go to the, to the kitchen, the auntie will say that, oh, your presentation of food is not 
the food is not presentable. So the auntie will, will just like, you know, I have to recut for you, I have to re-prepare everything for you. So this happens like most of the time, that every time we youngsters, when we go to the kitchen to offer dana, food, whatever, it always being, um, being supervised, so looked down. Yeah, supervised or being, being commented. Yeah, what's your view? Not only students, I also can now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I find it like this, this is like a practice in, in most of the temples. Yeah. But this is such a uh, yes. good question. Sorry to hear that though. I mean, uh, you know, this can happen when some certain devotees have been going yeah. to a certain temple for many years. Uh, they might inadvertently take the ownership of the kitchen. I mean, this can happen in yeah. anywhere in the world. Yes. So, um, I don't know whether you could have done it except in a different way, probably talking to the Sangha in the temple, uh, probably have a different connection to do, to do this. Uh, you could have considered probably different options uh, in that thing, rather going to have a clash with this lady. Yeah, that is how I think. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of these people have refused to come to the temple. They say, when I go to church, they feed me. Here, they scold me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you have those type of people, you have to learn to spread your metta. Don't use her as somebody who scolds you. That's Kuan Yin testing you. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably you would, have, you would have not cut the stuff. You would have brought things without cutting and asked her to cut. Yeah. Ah, yeah. you could have thought, this mm. lady is complaining about my cutting. Mm. Next time, I buy, the, I buy the food from the place where she likes and give to her to yeah. cut. But with metta. What with metta? Yes. So I think I think we yes. can work with any difficult person. We have to know how to handle the how to handle it, because we take the first impression and walk away and then blame that person. She means well. I mean, she <laughs> wants uh, you know. She wants to cut good in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my, my last question. Oh, yeah. trigger. Yeah. Uh, this also happened when I was a student. So we actually from the Buddhist society. So we actually invited monks for a house dana. So we actually invited, uh, I'm actually from Penang, so we invited a monk from Mahindrama Temple. So um, we offered the food, then at the same time we also eat together. Like after food, then we actually separate, then we eat together. Then right. the monk told us that we, are, we shouldn't do that because we will end up in hell. You what? End up in hell. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Got hell ah. Yeah, so there w this, this, this was actually a very serious yeah. uh, occasion. Like, we actually encourage the students to do dana, then suddenly end up in hell. Do you mean, do you mean uh, eating together with monks? Like, the, the monks are, or I mean, the monk, the monk was eating uh, on the table. So after, like, taking the food or whatever, we, a bit like he, we separate the food, so we eat at this side. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time. Your question? So, um, I don't know how true it is, but according to the monk, it was actually from the sutta. He was saying that um, a, lay, a lay woman was preparing the food, then suddenly the, the, the child was having problem, like disturbing the mother, then the mother gave the food to the son, and at the same time, the food offered to the monk or to the Buddha, something like mm. that. I couldn't remember the actual sutta, but that's why I'm, I'm actually asking for any clarity. I have read uh, a large amount of, I mean, not to say that, not yeah. to brag about myself. I, mean, I have never come across that kind of thing. Oh. Normally, like when uh, we eat in other places, uh, if there are young people, I know that they are talking a lot. Uh, they have to be fed. Yeah. <laughs> so I say, if you offer it to me, ask them to start eating. Yeah. And we don't have to make it a big problem. Yeah. But if you work with some adults, some elderly devotees, yes, I understand the concern. So then uh, we have to work with uh, them differently. But there is no such thing that uh, no. uh, to use hell to threaten people like in the Christianity. You are sinners. You have to learn from here. That's the starting point. Mm. Some places, you know, the, the Bible Belt yeah, in right. the southern uh, United States. So I think uh, there is no such thing. Probably their own house rules. Okay. Own house rules. So we respect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, the two temples I know, and especially even in Thai temples now, once the monks have started, then the lay yeah, people I don't think can, devotees have to yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the practice now. Yeah. But you have to take the consent from the monks, you know. Mm -hmm. 
if they say no then that's a different yeah. thing yeah. Okay. but normally uh, i think the modern sangha is okay you know yeah. they might say you, know, yeah. you don't have to wait mm. so i come from a tradition where when we cook we don't even taste the food ah yes yes that's we can't taste before yeah. sri lankan way sri yeah. lankan yeah. way yeah. now we taste la but the problem is <laughs> <laughs> You know, we want to give the no, monks some, the best. No, some monks are asking why this is so salty. Monks yeah, yeah. Because I did not taste it. Dandi <laughs> dandi. Why so sugary? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they said you have to taste and see whether they can eat yeah. or not. Yes. But taste, but only here. Don't take it in and you know get involved with yeah. the taste. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. These ways are getting around problems. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Others. There's this a practice where the alms giving is a form of dana. So for us as a Buddhist, when we give alms in like Pindapat, and especially um, not so much in Malaysia, but some other countries where you have monks uh, in the public uh, asking for alms, which is part of a practice, I have people asking me why Buddhist monks or the Buddhist practice encourage begging. To mm. the, and I don't know how to answer because from a Buddhist point of view, I said yes, it's um, I did. explain that is uh, for us lay people to practice dana the act of giving but when the non buddhist they say this like buddhist is uh, beggars. beggars so how do i uh, how to explain to people very interesting question mm. uh, the purpose of going for pindapatha is not begging food mm. uh, one thing is that at that time of india people did not bring food to the temple there was no tradition as such this bringing food to the temple started off with a sp- with a special story there was a monk who was followed by a lady all the time he cannot see others can see because of a bad karma the monk has done to this lady in a past life in a relationship so the king kosala said you don't go for pindapath because people are saying different things so you stay in the temple i will send food to you to you oh uh, that is the starting point of dana uh, in the temple premises So uh, initially pindapatha was started because at that time uh, there was no tradition for people to bring food like today. Second thing if you see the deeper meaning of pindapatha is to benefit many people as many people as the uh, sangha can otherwise sangha has lot of food in the temple they don't have to go for pindapatha. But I think according to the today's uh, scenario uh, Thailand is okay, but in other countries, uh, Sangha has to understand the the public perception. Sometimes, I mean, if this is leading, if, if there are Buddhist devotees, then it's okay. If you are going on a different neighborhood, uh, that might entail different yeah. other things. So I think yeah. they have to understand when you organize a pindapatha, uh, what do you call, in arms round, mm. then the devotees have to understand what will be the public perception in that area. Like you said, uh, they might be begging food. They might mm. not have the food. Mm. So uh, initially it was started because all monks had to go for pindapatha there is no devotee coming to temple with food that's one thing uh, second the larger idea is to benefit other people actually buddha's father asked the same question when he went to his city his ma- native city kapilavattu uh, he gave a dhamma talk uh, in his uh, what do you call palace father's palace then next day uh, he started going for pindapatha then the the king came in and said why you are you insulting us mm. said why because You're you are just as uh, not having food from us then the buddha said no this is an ancient tradition all the buddhas followed but when you take it to the public perceptions now i think this is one of the things that i at the beginning i said we have to know the modern uh, perceptions how we going to do this if it is a, now now you do pindapatha here indo sometimes right you do it in a certain center so we have to uh, i mean understand the situation and then to do the arms round uh, otherwise uh, i think there are certain things that we may have to answer but of course if they ask this is begging this is not begging this is to benefit devotees uh, many devotees uh, for offering dana that is the purpose then dana comes up then you can say dana because they have to start their path for dana otherwise they are not able to practice yeah. but they yeah. must understand dana means food it does not mean cash there are mechis walking around they go to restaurants reverend 
I mean, people are eating, yeah, they stand yeah. there and wait for... Uh, you put food in there, they get angry. Yeah, I think they are not real monks too. No, they are not. That's they're what not. proof. They just, Already proof. They just if if they get hair. angry, tell them, ah, you're not a monk, you're angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, they are, I, I, think, I think because of them, things have been further aggravated, I think. Aggravated, so yes. People are not happy because yeah. they are, they are not real monks. Yeah. So, they are selling certain, uh, what do you call? Uh, Tantrums. Uh, Talismans, Talismans and those things, and yeah, yeah. That's not the uh, bowl is not meant for that. Yes. So the good intention of Pintapata has been affected yes. by these people. And of course, our enemies yes. exploit that. Yes. Um, Your question. Not enemies, like Those of. Pante, just to add to this, the Pintapata um, is also generally for the forest monks who live in the forest and do meditation, they don't have kitchens for in the, in the monasteries, one, right? One yeah. way, one way so to So it's for it. their sustenance, yeah. so they have to go for Pindapat. Yeah. Of course, city monks, it's a, it's a, it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah, thank I think village-wise, it's okay. When a forest monk goes to a village, people understand. I think this might have come from the city, right? Hmm. City. Buddhist uh, bake. Uh, Maybe honest, maybe honest question. He doesn't yeah, know. Was an honest question. He doesn't know the, uh, what is the story behind that thing. Right. So you could have explained. This is not begging. Mm. This is to help many devotees mm. to give dana, so that they are making their practice. Mm. We yeah. actually say thank you to the monk for accepting. Yes, yes. Bante, uh, I would like to seek the clarification of doing dana because the uh, uncle. Uncle Vijaya say when we are cooking, we're not even supposed to. Traditionally, eat. yeah, in Sri Lanka. In because, Sri Lankan tradition. But now, can I ask? Because I do dana every week, just because people do dana, I also learn. <laughs> and uh, so it affects every week I do. So is it okay? Because you say when I prepare the food, so I prepare more, and then I keep some food for my family to eat or even my husband <laughs> is it okay uh, you, you you are the one who brought up this <laughs> <laughs> uh, i say go back to intention <laughs> <laughs> now the questions go that this way. is called so, passing the buck <laughs> okay <laughs> i take it this way yeah. now let's say now fortunately you have measurement cups Nowadays, you have measurement cups when you yeah. take the salt and uh, even uh, if you make a roti or whatever. Right, right. Uh, I think for a devotee who doesn't have this system, some devotees don't yeah, have a good... Yes, right. yes, and then trying to make dana for 30, 40 monks. So perhaps, uh, you know, they might have followed the same way as you said, you know, just... Uh, let's, let's see whether... Uh, yes. <laughs> but uh, the taste might not be good. Maybe you might have added a lot of salt to that. Right, so I think I think better to have your own system, own respectful system to do it. Not that there is only one way that fits into everybody. So do it with respect. Yeah. Uh, yes, th that is what I can the think. The intention my, is not yes. of greed. No, my question is not talking yeah, about Yeah, yeah. Your question is that is the volume is it because okay to I keep purposely aside? cook more. Yeah. So that since I'm offering to the monk, I also offering to my brother, my mom, my husband. Ah, yeah. yeah. So is it okay to yeah, keep yeah, yeah. those so, food so at, you, home, at home? So you cook at the same time for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's okay, right? Yes. Because, because I do that every because, week. <laughs> because you you are cooking for sangha here differently. Mm. Them different. I mean, maybe the taste wise okay, mm. uh, same, but this quantity for the sangha, this quantity for them. So I think it's separate. Yeah. There's and no what we would do is uh, we would put the sangha portion ahead first. Ah, we, yes. We, oh, uh, we that, that keep aside separate. for them first. Yeah. And then separate the, portions. Separate portions. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. A lot depends on common sense. A lot uh -huh. is the intention has to be pure. If the intention is lower dosa moha, then you're in trouble. Yes. Pante. Uh, uh, so one question on the uh, Pira Panther again. Arms uh, round. It's a good practice for that to have the to give the opportunity to, to the lay person to offer the dana. But as far as the uh, monks are concerned, I think it's uh, occupational hazard. 
occupational hazard in the sense that uh, you do not know what food is could be given to you. And how would the monk manage that in order to stay healthy? Mm. Very interesting. Uh, there was an article published by uh, Bangkok Post and Daily Mail, I think, at the same time, five years ago, that Thai monks getting sick because the food yeah, were not meant for their rich. own uh, custom-tailored bodies. So what they do is they don't eat like the, in the Buddhist time, like when you offer at the Buddhist time, that monk brings the food uh, near the uh, tree and then eats. Now they are bringing all these food to the temple that they are living. Very rich. Food. So they are sharing whatever. But uh, yes, so devotees have not been able to prepare some, uh, what do you call, healthy type healthy of food. food. Probably, uh, if you want to make some healthy food, sometimes it costs, sometimes. And plus, they have to offer a lot of sangha. So I think it's better to think about when you offer something to, to, to offer something healthy for them because you are health con we all are health conscious, so why, why don't mm. you think about sangha too, right? Not just bring the fast food and all that. So, uh, yeah, I think it, 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 Sri Lankan president, uh, six years ago, I think, the two presidents before, he was, think, he was asking to make a, I think, uh, make a plan from the Ministry of Buddha Sasana uh, for, for this thing. I mean, I mean, uh, to ask a kind of a certain methodology for oh. Sangha to be fed some healthy food. Yes. So, also we would ask the monk, because they may have health problems, they may be diabetic. Yes. Or whatever, or they may be vegetarian. So before we offer, we ask, Reverend, this is, got this, is it okay with you? Yeah. Normally they will tell you also if they're diabetic or whatever. So it's a question of today's day to be friendly with the monks, to mm -hmm. ask them what yeah. they need. And for them to... Not that you cook whatever you want and offer, yeah. and they should eat. Yeah. That is not nice, right? Yeah. And you never do it for your visitors who are yeah. coming to your house. Yeah. So I think, I think, as you said, there should be a mechanism. I'll share this with you. Uh, there was a Sri Lankan uh, monk who came from Sri Lanka, and this poor lady had made chicken rice. <laughs> and the poor monk, they put the chicken rice with the blood, you know that. <laughs> but he had no choice. He had to eat, and he was sick. He was, I mean, literally sick because he, he couldn't, couldn't eat. So we have to be conscious, lads. Who, where do they come mm. from? But on the other hand, the devotee has a lot of faith. Yeah, I think that faith has to be structured. That, yeah. yeah, we have to tell the devotees do it. She didn't know by understanding how to do it in the proper way. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we are almost. Yes. We are almost time. Shall we say last question? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rani Bhante, uh, Chandima, you are from Canada. I understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you tried asking for alms in public, you know? Just took your alms row and go anywhere around the streets of Canada and ask for alms like that. Uh, uh, I'd be getting the same questions, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. why are you guys begging? <laughs> so, uh, try asking for alms like depends, that. it depends. Actually, uh, uh, it depends. So we don't go, uh, plus we cannot go. It's very cold. We cannot go, like, the same way. But uh, devotees are organizing certain alms round. Uh, for Vesak or Katina, only on those days we make Even it. Even those who are not your devotees, you know, you just know they are just strangers. Just no, 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 no. You that's not there. that's not good with that culture. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that's why we have to understand the public perceptions. Yeah. Here it could be okay, yeah, uh, yeah because uh, there is not that culture unless it is a Buddhist area. Yeah. Maybe mm. some uh, Sri Lankans, maybe Thai, maybe yeah. Chinese, yeah. So we had to understand. The Buddha mm. asked us to work with the time, work with the country. Mm. Uh, don't just exhibit the same, the full thing wherever yeah. you go. Yes. So they organized Pindapata within the temple compound. Within the temple, yes. So everybody stands there with their food and the monks go. So. Yeah, yeah. But go I out, we will get arrested. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's Time o'clock. Thank you so much, Bante. It was really enlightening. I'm so happy. I'm so comfortable that it was the other way around. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much. We are. I'm amazed at your knowledge and your your knowledge of the the three pitaka. Yeah. And thank you for sharing. And we hope you come again. <coughs> and we got another session. Session. Right. 
Thank you very much, Bhante. Do we, Sa do we share the good karmas? We will share the good karmas. Yeah. Uh, to, to conclude this uh, forum, why is giving important? We have now already discussed about different elements of dana. Dana is the starting point. Not even the starting point. It is the uh, activity that we have to keep going while we are doing all the other uh, virtues. Uh, thank you, uh, Uncle Vijay Samarvikrama, for all this. Bye. And thank you, everybody, for coming up. Now we're going to share all these good karmas with the departed ones. May all the departed ones uh, who passed away in the name of all of us be uh, able to receive all these good karmas which we've been making today on the full moon day. May they be well and happy. May they attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May Deva, Naga, Mahidika also receive all these good karmas. May they bless and protect all of us Sangha members, even our Uncle Vijay Samar Vikram and everybody uh, uh, here at the Vihara. I want to be thankful to Vihara, Brother Leslie, and everybody here for uh, organizing this forum. And uh, may Deva Naga Mahidika uh, protect and bless all of you for good health, quality of life, prosperity, and safety. May they in particular bless for your Dhamma journey. May your Dhamma journey be a seamless, constant uh, one. May you be able to practice Dhamma without any problem. May Devanaga Mahidika finally attain the supreme bliss of Nippan. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. In this sansaric life, may we be able to be in the company of the Kalyana Mithras who can guide us, who can help us, who can be the light that is guiding to the next level of our spiritual path. May we be not in the company of the Papa Mithras, thinking thus we're going to make a wish. Imina punya kamina mami bala samagamu satang samagamu tu yavanibana patia. Finally, may all the good karmas which we've been accumulating today be supportive and helpful for all of us to attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Blessings. Abhivadana siddhis nichang badha pachainu chattaru dhamma vadhanti ayuvanu sukhang bala ayurarugya sampatti sagga sampatti mevach atu nibbana sampatti iminati saminjatu. Maybe we can uh, take a group photo after Brother Leslie uh, concluded. You want to say something? So we've come to the end of this evening's uh, Dhamma sharing and the dialogue. I hope you were highly entertained and enlightened <laughs> by both Uncle Vijaya and uh, Bhante Chandima. Um, of course, we'll plan for another one soon, Bande, before you leave. I think a good topic would be how to bring youths to the temples. I think there was a key point that was brought up by Uncle Vijay just now. How to? How to bring youths, youths, youths to the you know uh, Buddhist centers. I think that will be an interesting subject. And uh, so, before we end, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the monks of the Buddhist Mahavihara and the Committee of Management of the Buddhist Mahavira to thank Uncle Vijaya and Bhante Dr. Chandima for being with us this evening and sharing um, their knowledge on dana. I hope you all uh, will take home um, a good understanding of what dana is now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, just for your information, Bhante Chandima is organizing a two-day retreat on Saturday and Sunday, a two-day full stay-in retreat on Saturday, coming Saturday and coming Sunday. So if you have some time, you would like to join us, please do come on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. So with that, uh, have a pleasant journey back home and safe driving and sadhu. We'll take a group photo. Yeah, before they so leave. let's do ah. a group photo here. Yes.